gone! Wow, his first big league swing is going to be a grand slam home run. Swing and drive! Mountain right! Welcome to the show! Time to get into these team top prospect lists now on the call up. I'm Arm Waiten. He's Jack McMullen, and we're talking San Diego Padres today. We just wrote up that entire system. Top 15 prospects in the system, notable names to watch. Jack, I'm pumped to be getting into these team lists. They're always a lot of fun. It's a great way to connect with every individual fan base a little bit. And checking in on these Padres, it's amazing how good drafting and a couple good international free agents can get you loaded right back up again. It's funny because we haven't even hit the World Series yet. And you're like, all right, we got to start with the team top tens. And we budgeted out kind of the off season and how we're going to go about it. And, you know, a team top 10 every week. That should be fine, right? No, we're going to be six short. The off season's short, man. Yeah. Holy smokes. But it's going to be great to talk about the AL West and a couple of AL Central teams as we get into the beginning of next year. It's nice to start in the National League West. So, it, peek under the curtain, the way that we're kind of attacking the offseason is we're almost going to work division by division, and you're going to be pumping out a top 10 every week, you beast. Yep, yep, yep. and it's it's now really kind of top 15. We always use top 10 graphic, but we're ranking 15 now, and then the other names to watch. But, yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited about the schedule that you put together, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I, there's some redrafts that we're going to have to kind of – nudge in there a little bit too because i'm i'm ready to redraft the 2020 draft <laughs> sometime soon this offseason because there's so many interesting names in that uh but a lot of unique and fun content that ways but we're going to really be sure to get through all 30 teams this time around and you know now have a little bit more structure and an idea of how we're going to attack it uh as always the link to this article is in the episode description so go check that out if you want to follow along in terms of you know player to player and see the scouting write-ups and the grades if you're on YouTube, we will share our screen in just a second here. A uh, reminder before we jump into it, if you're on YouTube, if you could subscribe, help us grow the channel, that would be great. If you're listening on audio and haven't left a review yet or left a rating, that would be awesome as well. Thank you very much. So let's ju jump right in, Jack, to the other names to watch here because I would say the system has gotten far better uh, very quickly through drafting and, and a few other just – International free agents taking a big leap. Ethan Salas, who we're going to talk about, just signing the big ticket international free agent always helps and seeing him translate pretty much immediately. But it is top heavy. And when we put together, you know, some of these names to watch, there's some solid arms. It's it's mostly arms, but I feel like a lot of their names to watch have kind of been traded away in some lesser deals, like a Jackson Wolf, who I do like, left-hander that they, you know, send over for you know, Rich Hill and you know, G-Man Choi, I think they may regret that one. But again, are you going to lose sleep over, you know, a swingman lefty? Maybe not. But then they trade Weathers, who technically isn't a prospect, but that's another guy in that mold. I felt like they they did trade a lot of the mid-level guys, uh, and they're keeping the, the top-end guys. But that said, there are still some interesting names to watch. They always spawn, too. That's the thing. So, like, there are a couple guys at the Complex or in the Dominican right now for the Padres that are going to – become names to watch a month into next season but the guys that we id the one guy that has made his big league debut is alec jacob who was awesome with double a san antonio as a 25 year old and then he got the bump to the big leagues and in his first three major league innings no hits five punch outs and one walk yeah. and you say well how can he do that when he sits 85.8 with his sinker <laughs> it's because he's weird as hell and like mm -hmm that guy is a name to watch in some systems. And with the Padres system, he is. I view him as a Jimmy Herget starter kit. Jimmy Herget, who got save opportunities before Estevez really broke out in his age 30 season, right? So Herget is a guy that will be part of a big league bullpen for the next seven to eight years. I think that's where Alec Jacob is. He's just a weird look. Everybody needs yeah. a Simber or a Tyler Rogers, and Alec Jacob is one of those guys. Absolutely. Jagger Haynes, another guy. Yeah, real quick. No, I was just going to say that it's that weird, funky look that is becoming so popular to have in your bullpen. Uh, and and you have the little bit of success. So it, it makes sense that he's one of those weird reliever prospects, but he's a prospect. And I think he's going to be a part of that bullpen next year. 
And I think you take him over Kevin Copps, who is a year older, and it really has kind of stalled out for him in the upper levels. That guy was a Golden Spikes winner, but yeah. he was doing it with one pitch in the mid to high 80s, and professional hitters can gear up for one pitch, unfortunately. Yeah. Jagger Haynes, another guy, fifth round pick out of like middle of nowhere. The high school he went to, the town that his high school is in, I'm blanking on the name of it. But the population of that town, I think, is 500. Oh and the population God. of his hometown, Whiteville, North Carolina, is 5,000. But he was the youngest guy in the 2020 draft, super rural North Carolina. No looks because it was the COVID draft in 20. So the Padres pay him in the fifth round. He immediately undergoes TJ, but he was getting some punch outs in low A. Yeah, he's interesting. 6'3 lefty with a good slider. And that's the thing that really stood out is the slider and the changeup are pretty nasty. Fastball was sitting 93, 94. It was short spurts because he was working back from TJ. But this is definitely a name to watch because under the radar, as you mentioned, guy that I think this is an area where the Padres always cook is, is kind of these under the radar type of, of prospects that almost a 2020 type drafts. I think if the draft was like that every year, the Padres would just be better than everybody else because they seem to do more with less when it comes to scouting and just IDing you know, who they like. And I think they, they clearly saw something with Haynes here. Secondary stuff looks pretty good. I'm, I'm interested to see how he continues to develop as, you know, they build him back up again. Uh, but he did shut down at some point later in the season. And, you know, there were kind of some sporadic outings. So I'm not sure if he dealt with some other issues, but that's something to monitor as well. For sure. Um, Ryan Berger is the next guy and Berger is kind of the other flip of the coin. He's constantly on the mound back to back hundred inning seasons he was a swingman at West Virginia when Alec Manoa had his first round year and he had an ERA in the low twos. And then Jackson Wolf was also in that rotation at West Virginia. So there was some pedigree. They were all thrown to Paul McIntosh, who's the Marlins yeah. prospect too. Yeah. Shout out the Mountaineers in Morgantown. But Berger, he's always on the mound. He's got just enough going on in the arsenal. The fastball can run into the mid 90s and he's just a zone pounder. That should be a sub three ERA and high A and double A. Just change that, by the way. So we're good. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he strikes out more guys than I think you would expect. And command really never gets away from him. I, you know, you need guys like that. <laughs> you need guys like that in the system, especially outside of the, the top 15. You know, he's not going to miss a ton of bats, as you kind of mentioned and alluded to, but he can mix in four pitches, fill up the zone and keep guys off balance. And the end zone whiff rate, a little bit better than you would expect. Uh, I, I'm, I'm interested to see a full season from him again next year now at the higher levels because I think he, he kind of took advantage of the high A competition. Had some spurts where he was really good in double A, but it's hard to measure because it seems like so many of these types of pitchers will have one or two blow-ups in double and it inflates the ERA. And then they'll have a stretch of where, I mean, I'm looking at a stretch right here from Berger where he goes five innings shutty, or sorry, five and two third shutout, six shutout, six shutout, back to back to back. Yeah. But then... Very next start, you go to Midland, five earned runs, and that inflates the ERA a little bit. So these are some of the guys that the numbers may be a little inflated, and then they get to the big leagues, and they're surprisingly more effective than people would expect. For sure. Um, two more guys in the names to watch, and they're two total projects. Isaiah Lowe is a right-hander that got a brief stint in low A with Lake Elsinore. Overslotted in 2022, 11th round was paid like a fourth or fifth rounder with 400K. And Lowe is a raw pitching prospect, but was going to Wake Forest. So you know that that guy is mentally <laughs> like in tune with what he wants to do pitching wise. You don't commit to Wake Forest or Vandy if you're not fully committed to understanding your body and every intricacy in that. And yeah. Lowe is clearly that guy. He's a thick guy, 6'1, 220. He's built, he wears that 220. Um, and he's got a mid 90s heater. It's, it's pretty much like, Based on the looks that I got, bowling ball type stuff. Yeah. I, this is a guy that could have had some major helium, if not for some injuries, because he starts the year in low A, makes three starts where he was sharp. I mean, the first start of the year, three and a third against Inland Empire, he goes shut out, four strikeouts, no walks. Follows that up with four innings, one run on a solo shot, six Ks against a good Modesto lineup. Then Vesalia four innings, three runs, but only one earned, two walks, seven Ks. And then unfortunately hits the uh, the IL. It was unspecified. Then we heard, you know, shoulder issue, like shoulder inflammation. And we only saw him throw one more time at the complex 
and that was at the end of August. So I don't know what the the health situation is for him, but he looks really good out of the gate. And the data, he's kind of that data darling, like you mentioned, and that's typically who Wake Forest IDs now, even in high school. There's a lot to like here if he can stay healthy. So hopefully we can get a full healthy season from Lowe next year because there was uh, some exciting flashes there. Yeah. And then the last guy is a, a pure project and, you know, glimmer of hope. Lamar King Jr. is the son of Lamar King, who was an edge rusher for the Seattle Seahawks. He was a defensive end, former first round pick. And uh, Lamar King is a 6'3", 215 pound catcher at 19 years old. So yeah. when you look like a physical specimen and you put up solid numbers in the complex, albeit in 20 games, you're going to make a names to watch list especially with those bloodlines. I mean, you just know he's an athlete too. Uh, he looks like he could be an edge rusher as well. I got some video of some of the swings that he got off in the complex. It looks pretty good. Like, I was expecting it to be a little bit more raw. So I'm, I'm eager to see a little bit more of Lamar King. They've been very careful with him. They want him to, you know, develop very slowly, as you mentioned, a project. But uh, I think they'll kind of take the training wheels off a little bit more next year. It could so. be a lot of whiff and it might not work or – we could have a guy that's going to rise really quickly. And in the Padre system, you always got to be a little bit more hyper aware for those types. They already have a teenage catcher that's going to like fly through. So yes, no yep. need to worry. You can kind of work him like a normal prospect. Yeah, exactly. So we'll jump into the top 15 and at number 15, and we'll spend a little bit more time obviously on the top 10. So we might fly through these, you know, next five, a little bit similarly to we the names to watch, but 15 is Marcos Castagnon infielder uh finished the year in double a this was a guy that i didn't have much on before i did this the system dive and the more i watched the, the more interested i i was in him because he hits the ball hard he plays second base he can play third base defensively he's not great but he does have the ability to at least play those two different spots i was impressed by the combination of actually palatable contact rates and impressive power and, and we saw that you know in in the home run output in low A in 2022, and then still put up 17 more between high A and double A. He's an aggressive hitter. So he was a candidate that, you know, I thought, okay, he gets to double A. He's going to get picked apart a little bit. He didn't, he held his own. We've seen exit velocities as high as 113. Uh, this is a bat that could end up just playing. You know, you keep waiting for him to come down to earth or, you know, meet his, his competition. But so far he hasn't really done that. So it could be one of those guys that just gets a, away with an aggressive approach and makes more contact than you think. He was in Brewster the year after I was in Brewster. So I remember oh, wow. like I seeing the name and I was like, okay, you know, who is he? But power program in UC Santa Barbara, he was really good in 2021. He was a four-year guy, if I'm not mistaken. 18, 19, COVID shortened his 2020. He wasn't going to go. So he came back for 21 and had an OPS just over 1,200. I don't think he played the whole year though. But he, he was teammates with bunch of pitching prospects. Michael McGreevy was at Santa Barbara when he was there. Uh, Chris Troy in the Red Sox system yep. was at Santa Barbara when he was there. So power conference, a lot of success out on the West Coast. I'm a fan. He's 24 years old in double A. So you question like, hey, how quickly can he get there? That kind of thing. And I'm sure that his age does diminish the prospect value. A little bit, you know, and it's funny because there used to be a time where 24 and double A was pretty much par for the course, right? But I think it still is this, league average. <laughs> yeah. Especially in this system, though, it's just it's it's different. I will say him in the PCL, I almost would rather see him in the Texas League. And I know the, the ball still flies there, but in the PCL, I think he's gonna just get juiced even more. And and, and I think the pitching will work more to his favor there uh, as as an aggressive guy. I, I kind of want to see him just continue in double A and then get the bump up to triple because I know he's going to put up good numbers there. Uh, this is an interesting power bat that you know, could be a bench player, but may hit enough to be a, a regular. It's You never know with these types of guys, especially when the EVs are as strong as his are. So definitely a name worth you know following and, and definitely an underrated guy that was a 12th round pick back in 21. Gotcha. 14. <laughs> this is probably the most uh, – dated prospect in the system given that he signed uh, in 2017 and is just been banged up a little bit eggy rosario second base slash third base another kind of versatile infielder here uh, in this padre system signed for 300k in 2017 and rosario has really hit at every stop it's been pretty amazing to see him just continuously put up good numbers and he i think he hurt his ankle in in the winter league and and had some other little ailments that 
shortened his season this year, got a later start, made up for lost time after shaking the rust off, finished really strong in AAA, and then got an opportunity uh, at the big league level where he held his own offensively as well. Uh, he just screams bench piece to me and, and a solid one, good feel to hit, sneaky power, uh, capable defender, both at third and second, definitely a better defender than, than Castagnon. And I mean, they even threw him at shortstop a couple of times when they're in a pinch. I think he's fine in, in an emergency or, you know, late game kind of shuffle around. He should be a bench player for them next year. And that's kind of what I'm expecting. More athletic than you'd expect from a five, seven kind of stocky guy too. Yeah, he is truly five foot seven. He signed at 17 at five, seven, 150. He's now five, seven, 190. So maybe they were thinking he was going to grow a couple inches, not the case, <laughs> but he put on 40 pounds of good weight. So he can kind of be that fire truck or like fire hydrant that, you know, Jose Altuve is a lot of those short stocky guys. They can pack a bit more of a punch than I think a lot of people expect. Yeah. I mean, 103 mile per hour, 90th percentile is, is above average from a, a guy like that. And it's bat speed. It's punchy in terms of just short and quick to the ball. A lot of line drives and you'll get the home run output though. He gets it in the air. So this is a dude that, you know, if, if you have an injury and you got to plug him in for, 40, 50 games, he can have a nice little stretch there where you know he pleasantly plugs in and gives you above average you know, league offense. But I think there's a really good chance that he's just a solid bench player uh, that can play multiple spots in the infield. Uh, unfortunately, not tall enough to plug in at first, but he can play third, can play second, and you know can, can fill in at short when needed. Yeah. 13 is a guy that I, I think is going to kind of be ranked all over because of his age and, and you know his polish, but he's a tough gauge for me. Victor Lizarraga, right-handed pitcher who finished the year in high A. He was a million-dollar international free agent, and so that's going to always lead him to be you know, maybe ranked a little bit higher than 13. Um, also, 19 years old and put together another quality season. He threw 94 innings in low A in 2022, really solid numbers, then gets up to high A, 94 innings again, solid, solid numbers. Uh, but I look at the stuff. And I'm trying to figure out kind of how he's going to be able to get outs against better competition. He's 6'3", 180. So there's the hope that he, he can develop into a little bit more strength and, you know, tap into a little bit more velocity. He sits more 91, 93 right now. Shape is you know pretty, pretty standard. Like there's, there's nothing really special about the shape or release. So it's pretty much a run of the mill fastball, but I'm hoping that there's more in there because it's low effort. And he's again, a pretty big dude that has plenty of room to fill out. The problem for me that kind of held him out of the top 10 was there's not a secondary I can get really excited about. Uh, the slider kind of flashes average. Uh, change up looks average at best right now. Curveball was the only pitch that, that looks above average, and that's an upper 70s curveball that he used more and more down the stretch. Uh, but, you know, you, you need a little bit more in the secondary department, especially if your fastball is not that great. But what stands out to me is he continues to get outs. He just seems to have that poise on the mound. He's very polished for a teenager, and I think all that combined with maybe one tick up, he could be a nice back end of the rotation arm potentially. Yeah, if you have four 50 to 55 great pitches, you better be throwing them all about 25% of the time in this era of baseball. Like you either need to have an exceptional pitch or you need to have a great pitch mix, and it feels like this guy doesn't really – have a firm grasp on the pitch mix yet. But again, he's 19 years old and he just finished his second full season off the complex. So he's already throwing a ton of innings at 19. The thing that kind of jumps out to me is, okay, yes, he's 19. Yes, he's in high A. He looks so much different than the other teenage pitchers at this level yeah. because the other teenage pitchers are the ones that can run it up to 98, 99 and have mm -hmm. a wipeout slider. They just have no clue where it's going. And there's precedent to that. There's really not much precedent to a guy that's trying to pound the zone and is punching out seven guys per nine and yeah. is trying to roll a bunch of ground balls at 91, 93, and he's 19 years old. 100%. And, and that's why, actually, I love that you said that. I would love to see him throw more of a bowling ball fastball, more of a sinker, because right now it's more of that traditional forcing. If you have a little bit more sink to it, be a ground ball guy, less pressure on you know getting whiffs and that might that profile might make a little bit more sense uh, and be easier to project into the back of a rotation because right now it's it's like you mentioned a little bit of that tweener got to see which way he's going to go but i think it's worth noting that there's a lot more development to be had here and the fact that he's already able to get outs at high a without really harnessing his stuff totally and knowing what kind of pitcher he wants to be is a, a testament to his poise and, and polish 
And every rotation in baseball needs a ground ball pitcher. They need a sinker guy. Like sinker guy is never going extinct. And the guy that can hit the lower outside corner to righties is never going extinct. And he picked up above average ground ball rates already. If he can have a little bit of a heavier fastball, I think we'll see really, really good ground ball rates. And that might be the way for him to go with already some you know, above average command. Yeah. Number 12, name that we heard a lot about this year. A lot of people were very excited about him. First base prospect, Nathan Martorella, who finished the year in double A. Limited to first. It's all about the bat here, but the bat provided plenty to be excited about. He was a draft prospect out of high school, opts to go to Cal, not really great out of the gate at Cal and then has this breakout junior year, which kind of earns him the opportunity to get drafted in the top 10 rounds. He gets drafted in the fifth round, but under slot and he's really just turned into a better hitter in professional baseball. And I think just kind of parlayed that momentum from his junior year and then into professional ball. And now we're seeing him finally tap into that power that a lot were dreaming on when he was a high school prospect and I mean, he had a nice year this year. There's no way around it. And he was fantastic in high A, met his match a bit in double A, but then finished pretty well, had a pair of home runs in a playoff game, which again, won't show up on the fan graphs or traditional stats that you're looking at. But to me, that was a really encouraging way to finish the season after battling, you know, some issues with quality breaking stuff at double A. But this dude has above average exit velocities, uh, at least an average field to hit. And, you know, he's very patient at the plate. And that's going to be the trend, by the way through the rest of this this uh, episode, the Padres ID guys who are very patient at the plate for the most part. Martorell is another one. There's going to be a handful more. But patient, above average power, at least average field to hit. There's an offensive profile here that I think is, is pretty exciting uh, if he can improve against the secondary stuff. Do you think 60-grade pop is in the tank, or do you think he's kind of capped at 55? That was a tough one for me. It's funny you asked that. I was I was sitting on that for a little bit. Just like, how much more could there be in there? I think when you're looking at comparing him to big leaguers, I think he's probably capped at 55. Mm-hmm. But I do think he has the ability to translate that into 55 game power, you know, and 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 consistently get into it. But you look at his frame; he's pretty stocky. He's pretty big. Uh, I don't know how much more room there is there. I, I think he's probably capped there. Got you. Okay, because like, if this guy can you know, give you the ability to dream on 25 homers a year that unlocks a new level of his prospect intrigue. But mm-hmm. the thing that's probably holding him outside the top 10 is because it's, it's a hard stretch to dream on 25 homers. A yeah. Big. That's exactly it, man. Right. Like I'm thinking about it from you and I are building a team and, and I like Martorello a lot and I think he could be a nice piece for you, but yeah. you're trying to build a ball club and you you, know, you don't really target first base prospects, maybe fifth, sixth, seventh round like the Padres did. What am I dreaming on from my first baseman here? I want 30 homers, right? I want to at least have a shot at 30 homers with my first yeah. baseman. Or he's got to be able to hit for a ridiculous average and be like a Luis Arias type, who I know he doesn't play first, but I put him at first and not worry about power if, if it's like that. Generally, it's going to be the power. It's a stretch, as you said, to dream on 30 homers. So either the hit tool has got to – He'll come up a little bit and he's got to be more of the Josh Naylor type or he's got to walk with the best of them, which he does walk and squeak out a little bit more juice. It's a little bit of a tweener profile for a first base and you got to really hope that he can you know, tap into every bit of that game power. Uh, and I think 20 to 25 is possible, but from first base, you got to really get on base at a strong clip. And you, know, you look at a Ty France, for example, that guy's struggling to provide first base value because he's not always hitting for the power that you want to see puts a lot more pressure on the hit tool. Yeah. Next up, the guy that I thought had as good of a pro debut as as you could have just fresh off of the draft in 23 Homer Bush, uh, another bloodlines guy. He's really Homer Bush jr. Son of former big leaguer Homer Bush, who was drafted by the Padres. Um, Bush played with Jacob Wilson at Mm -hmm. Grand Canyon. And I think got a lot of looks because of that. But Bush is a good player in his own respect. Held his own on the Cape and had a really, really good year at Grand Canyon. We know it's a very hitter-friendly environment, but 370 is 370. And the WAC, yes, it is very easy to hit there. But a lot of the underlying numbers look good in terms of bat to ball. The power is below average. But just seeing him go to pro ball and still be able to find the gaps right away was impressive. And as a fourth rounder, I thought they did a good job of IDing somebody that's a high probability big leaguer because I see an easy above average field to hit. I think there's potential for a plus field to hit. I, 
I needed more to be able to, you know, put the 60 future. I just, I, I don't know if, if I've seen enough yet there, but plus runner ability to stick in center and play a high level there, play all three outfield spots, uh, has continued to get better as a base dealer, great makeup, bloodlines, and the field of hit translated immediately. I mean, he held his own in low A I, and then showed out really well at the finish of the year in double A, skipped right over high. I'm really interested to see a full season of Bush next year. I think he could have a lot of helium. At the very least, this guy is speed and defense out the ass, and he's going to figure it out defensively. And I, he probably bumps that 50-55 to like a 55-60 if he leans into it. The thing that jumped out to me is this guy really didn't strike out in his first taste of pro. Oh, well. And college is a different beast because guys that don't strike out in college, like, okay, great, you were an amazing college hitter. But mm-hmm. there are guys that don't strike out in college, and then the K rate jumps from 7% to 19%. And it's like, hey, where did that go? But this guy truly did not strike out much. It was 24 punch outs, 20 walks in 44 games. Yep. So he was constantly putting the ball in play and letting the speed eat. And the Padres are really lucky because, yes, you need that guy in every organization, a guy that can make things happen just by getting bat on ball. And they have two of those in the top 11. Which is amazing. And then also, I teased it, he doesn't chase. 19% chase rate. In a pro debut, that's amazing, right? You you, you get to pro to ball, everything's moving more, everything's harder. You also want to try to do something, right? You want to make an impact. And he didn't stray from his approach whatsoever. He walked at a great clip. So you have speed, defense, walking, you know, ability to get on base and, you know, a, a field of hits. I, I, I'm i really interested in this guy. And now that the, the stolen base ability has continued to get better, what's fascinating is he's big. He's got a pretty projectable frame. I don't know how much more he's going to fill out. I don't know if that's something that they even want him to do, but he could even get a little bit wiry strong. And maybe the exit velocities tick up because right now they're below average. But even if he's more of that slap hitter that drives the ball around all around the yard and runs into one from time to time, I mean, that's still a, a really good big league caliber player, you know, fourth outfielder, maybe a little bit better than that. But I think he's got a chance to be a big league regular if the bat can continue to progress the way it looks like it is. So I just went to Google Images to remind myself what Homer Bush Jr. kind of looks like in a, in a uniform, like how he fills out the uniform. And it took, I typed in Homer Bush and it took me to Homer Simpson disappearing into the bush. Oh, that's a great, I use that one a lot. I use that yeah, a lot. Like it's a really good one, but then I was like, oh wow, Homer Bush Jr. baseball. Um, and yet like he doesn't fill out the uniform just yet. So he can either fill out the uniform and get more pop or he can stay like that and be a game changer with his speed. Yeah. And I think there could be a little bit of, of both, right? I, I think there's room to add some without losing the speed because it's long strides. It's not just like about just being insanely explosively quick. He already flashed a 106 too, which, you know, when you look at the 90th percentile, it's well below what most guys that are capable of flashing 106s, 107s. So, I mean, even average exit velocities, Bush will be in a really good spot. So this is a definitely a name to watch going into next year. I think he could have some major helium. Uh, and and I thought the, the showing in double A was impressive. Another guy that just benefits from smaller strike zones and getting away from the lower levels. Uh, with how patient he is. Yep. Top 10. Top 10 time. And this is, a, a, I would say, a polarizing prospect to a degree. Like, I'm, I'm already prepared for the why is Samuel Zavala so low? And I'll explain that. Uh, but, you know, he, he's somebody that you look at the results, he's really produced at, at the lower levels at the DSL. And that had a lot of uh, buzz around him after being signed for $1.2 in 2021. The strong numbers in the DSL, the strong numbers as a really young prospect in low A, and then, you know, decent numbers this year uh, again in low A, and then, you know, struggled in his brief stint in high A, but that's okay because he's young. But I, I do think he is going to continuously struggle against some better competition, and that's what keeps him at the 10 spot rather than, you know, some of the the higher spots that you'll see him in. Um, for me, I'm just trying to figure out where he what, what his profile is, where he fits in, because I do think that there's a tweener aspect to him, uh, given that there's a fair amount of swing and miss that I think will get exposed at, at the higher levels. There's not as much power is as people maybe were hoping at this stage. He's young, he's 19, so he's got time to tap into more, but the exit velocities were average at best. Uh, the, the power output was fine in some hitter friendly environments, uh, what I think is really bolstered his numbers at the lower level, specifically in low A, is 
another extremely patient hitter. He runs a chase rate of just 14%. So, I mean, this is somebody that he's going to take his walks. He's going to really shrink the zone and just take advantage of pretty inexperienced pitching. I think he was just more uh, polished than a lot of his competition. His swing dude has a lot of moving parts. It's one of the biggest leg kicks I've ever seen with a big barrel tip and his hands push back towards the catcher, which is okay. Like being back over your back legs. Okay. But if it's a pronounced move with a barrel tip and the leg kick, there's a lot to time up and his hands get so far away from him that it just seems like it's very long and, and takes a while to get, you know, to the zone. Um, And so there's that balance of wanting to, you know, snap the barrel behind you, but not have it be too far behind you. So between the leg kick and then having his hands starting so far behind him and the barrel tip and all these moving parts, there's a lot of end zone whiff and there's a lot of weak contact. And I think that's why Zavala is a tough guy to project for me. But when the hit tool is below average and the exit velocities haven't really improved and are you know, average right now at best, it's like, what's the profile? There isn't one. There, there's, you know, he's kind of stuck between two profiles and you want him to just kind of pick one at this point. And I know he's got a ton of time. He's 19 years old and a young 19, but he's also in high A. So might now might be the time to pick one. And you said he struggled in high A. I think they're struggling. And then I think there's four for 51 with a 40% K rate struggling. And that's what he yes. did in high yeah. A. And it, you know, was a very hard watch at the end of that season after he was amazing in Lake Elsinore for the beginning of the year. Yeah. And that's what happens when, you know, you're, you're just taking your walks and punishing and mistakes. New level. Yeah. Max, max of one Oh seven is, was surprising to me. And I was expecting some better flashes than that. Uh, given, you know, a lot of the, the power grades that you'd see out there. Um, you know, I, I just, I think you can dream on above average because he's got long levers. He's very, he's very wiry as well. Like he's got plenty of room to add muscle. What's impressive is he does play a great outfield and he moves well in center field for a guy that's an average runner, maybe slightly above at best. He gets great jumps, great reads, covers a lot of ground. But I think given that he's a 70% zone contact guy, uh, contact rate in the mid sixties. And it, I think it's kind of expected at this point that he's going to whiff. I don't think he's going to, it's more likely that he makes a big leap in the power department. than he makes a big leap in the bat to ball department to the point where he's, you know, an above average hit tool guy. So if, if there's a chance that he puts on 20 pounds of muscle and can't stick in center, I'm okay with that with this profile because I'd rather him be a corner masher than, oh, he can stick in center. But what what's his offensive profile? It's, you know, below average hit and average power. Like that doesn't really play. So I'd like to see him lean into the muscle up, be a really solid corner outfielder. He's got an above average arm. And that low chase rate, high power, high whiff, good defense in a corner – that's a prototype that baseball teams love. And I, and I wonder if maybe he leans into that side of things a little bit more. Yeah. Let's see how much red meat and, you know, carbs <laughs> he eats this off season. And if he comes back and he looks like a tank, then we know what he decided. Yeah. Yeah. Or they might want him to stick in center. They might believe that the, the hit tool can come along. That's uh, Padres prerogative. I'm interested to see how he develops. There are enough center fielders on this list. Yes. I, just, I don't think well, they need him there. I think if you turn him into a corner masher, he looks good. Well, we're about to talk about one that, you know, I don't think anybody would have him ranked ahead of Zavala. I'm interested to see, you know, going into 2024, if anybody will have it this way. But, you know, I feel pretty confident about this one. And this guy's a center fielder. Jacob Marcy, outfielder with double A at the end of the year. And, I mean, Marcy was awesome this year. Uh, it, it was really amazing to see what he did in terms of the output offensively, stolen bases, defense, all that good stuff. Sixth, sixth round pick in 2022. I mean, this is a fun player that I, I'm really impressed with what he's doing, by the way, in the Arizona Fall League right now. It's plus field to hit. Power's probably fringy. And, you know, at best, it's probably closer to below average. I'd say there's a chance for it to be average. But above average run, good defender in center field, can play all three outfield spots because his arm's above average. And there's something specific here that stood out to me when I was watching the video of him defending. He is comfortable going straight back as, as comfortable as, as really a lot of, and maybe any minor leaguer I've seen outside of the most elite outfielders out there where it's straight over his head. It's, he is so comfortable going straight back, knowing where he is and making the grab. Uh, he's obviously comfortable going you know laterally as well. I, I think he's a really good center fielder. And then you mix in what he was able to do offensively 
He rarely whiffs. Contact rates were just a hair under 90% in terms of in zone. Overall contact rates were great. Guess what, Jack? He's patient too. (laughs) He does not expand the zone at all. Walked a ton. Got on base at over a 400 clip. And, you know, he still snuck out 16 homers. And Fort Wayne's not a hitter-friendly environment. 13 of those 16 home runs came in Fort Wayne, Jack. And, you know, I don't think he's going to hit more than 10 home runs, 10, 12 home runs at the big league level. But he hits the ball in the air and he'll have the ability to sneak some out, which I think does elevate his floor a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Is he the fall league MVP at this point? No, it's got to be Triantos, right? Um, What's he doing? I think Triantos has is averaging three hits a game. I'm not even kidding. Okay. So Marcy is He's up there though. He's up there. 14 games. Marcy has an OPS over eleven over eleven hundred and is eleven for eleven in the stolen base department. (laughs) So he's been amazing. Yeah. But if Triantos is better, then I just have to tip my cap. Which is insane. I think Triantos is hitting like 550. But okay. no, Marcy's been spectacular. And the thing that stands out to me is he's so comfortable with his approach. And he just got better and better and better as the year went on. And then another guy that just got more comfortable at the higher levels that he'll lean into certain spots and say, okay, 2 0 count. I want to do some damage here. Fastball middle in. I'm going to try to rip one pole side in the air. And, and he he did that. And I think that's part of the reason why he's able to squeeze out a little bit more power than most players with, you know, his exit velocities, which are, you know, just a, kind of a tick below average. The other thing that stands out to me is you look at the ability to spray the ball the other way. Um, a guy that just really coils and stays there and can get to any pitch. His hands are really adjustable. And it's just, it's just an overall field to hit that is as good as just about any prospect in the system outside of, you know, a couple of guys that we're going to talk about at the very end here, 35% ground ball rate. He really gets the ball in the air consistently. I was, I was impressed with this guy. Good numbers and good enough numbers against lefties. And if you take his final, I think it was like 50 something games of the season, he had an OPS right around a thousand. Um, so, I mean, this is somebody that just got better and better and better as the year went on. And then he mentioned the bags in the AFL, the bags in the regular season, Marcy needs to get some respect because I think he's going to make, he's going to get some big league action next year. You think so? I, if they need him, you know, because he, he can plug in in center field. He could be that fourth outfielder for them. He puts bat on ball. He's fast. I, I think they kind of need somebody like that. Do you think that he will at any point, because Grisham, I think has two more years of arbitration think, left. Is it, is it two more? I thought he maybe only has one more. I don't know. I think he could get a shot though, because the field of hit just being that good. And then all the complimentary tools. And again, it's not like he's a slap hitter. Uh, There's enough in there where he's going to sneak some home runs out. I'm very intrigued to see how they handle him next year, but I think he's in the fall league for a reason. They want to get more looks and see how aggressive they can be with him because he might be able to help them next year. I win. Grisham has two more RB years. Do you think at any point, Assuming health for Trent Grisham, Marcy takes plate appearances away from Trent Grisham. <laughs> if he He's looks like the defender, Marcy is probably the next guy to hop in center field. If he looks like the defender I I saw in video, you know, in in, in a, some more cavernous ballparks in the PCL with the ball carrying, I think I think it's very possible, especially if Grisham's struggling. Yeah, which is kind of a common thing. Unfortunately, I love um, Trent Grisham. Unfortunately, like, unfortunately, yeah. Just not clicking. Number eight, a guy that I think was probably one of the biggest breakout prospects in the minor leagues. We've talked about a few other guys in other systems, like a Justice Bigby and, and some others, but Graham Pauly was as big of a breakout guy as I think you're going to find, and definitely the breakout hitter in this system. Another player who finally just found it his junior year of college and had a really solid season at Duke. Not enough to get drafted as high as Martorella because he didn't come with some of the high school intrigue that Martorella had and didn't quite have the season that Martorella had as a junior. So he gets picked in the 13th round of the 2022 draft. And really from that point onward, just hit it every stop. And this is a swing, by the way, that I love. He's got it all down. And and it reminds me a little bit of Colt Keith. Not as much power, but a really good field to hit. Still flashes above average power. And again, another guy with a really good approach. But he gets ready so early. He is set. He sees the ball. I mean, he's pretty much in his slot, leg kick, like leg up, ready to launch, like pretty much when the, when the pitcher splits his hands, which 
you can see how that really works in his favor because he's in such a good rhythm. He sees the ball early. He makes great decisions. And when he gets one off to his pull side, you see the flashes of, of well above average power, but mm -hmm. he's a good hitter who can spray line drives all over the yard. Uh, I've really enjoyed watching Paulie turn into a very legitimate prospect and a bat that, again, another guy that I think they're trying to figure out if, if he can fit in at some point next year, at, if they need him, because they're giving him a lot of reps in left field now. And I think that's the one spot. If you're a prospect forcing your way up, it's got to be in left. And you know, maybe that's what they're starting to look at here. We're talking best breakouts in the next couple of weeks. On this show, we we have one of the what, Thursday episodes or Wednesday episodes dedicated to like kind of an all breakout team. We're not going to go position by position because you know there's some overlap here, but Polly absolutely there with the Justice Big B and with some other guys too. But um yeah, I mean, I don't know. I guess I had not heard much about Graham Polly heading into this year, except he can, you know, hit the ball out occasionally like that's kind of it i i only heard power and that was it but he showcased so much more than just power and it was based on like everything i heard from the people in fort wayne and you know all that jazz like it seems like grand Polly can truly mash and it might not matter what level and he's a duke guy Yep. And I don't want to say you have a Duke bias, but there is an arm latent Duke bump because you know that they turn out high character guys annually. Yeah. Well, and, and it's not a coincidence, dude. I mean, look at the look at the talent that Duke has churned out in the last few years. And right, like a Mark Stroman and a Mike oh, Stud. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then also Matt Mervis and Joey Loperfito and these under the radar guys who you know end up maximizing their abilities as later round picks. And yeah. and I think that is a testament to you know, some of the talent that that this school can churn out and that program can churn out. Paul, we have heard nothing but great things about the makeup. And you look at the swing, though. It is one of my favorite in terms of just the rhythm. It is so rhythmic, and it's just a dance that just he seems to have down. And he, it it seems like it's hard to slump and hard to lose your consistency when you've got your moves in that kind of rhythm. His hands start really relaxed. It's a very quiet move with his hands. He has that leg kick, but he gets into it really early. He sees the ball early, and he stays in that lower half really well. This is one of – and again, a lot of the reasons why I like his swing are the same reasons why I loved Colt Keith's swing. A lot of similarities there. Just Keith is a lot more brute and, and, and has 30 home run upside, whereas Pauly's, you know more 20-ish. But Pauly's a really fun player, and the defense at third was solid. He looked rough and left, I'll be honest. Um, but he had never played there, not even in college. So it, it was, it, this is an opportunity for him to just get reps out there. And that's a big reason why he's in the fall league. He's a good third baseman. I think he's a very, very solid one there. He can play decent second base. I assume he can get better in left field. He's also a guy that savvy on the base paths. He's not a great runner. He's an average slightly above at best. He still bags because he's a smart, heady player. Uh, I think this is someone that's always just going to get the most out of their tools, but above average hit, above average power, some versatility. Paulie's going to be a piece for them. I really believe that. He's an opportunistic base stealer. Um, based on the swing alone, it's hard to believe there are 389 people that teams preferred over him. That's like, that's a weird one. But, yeah, because you watch the video and it's like, that's a top 10 round selection. I don't but, know how he's yeah, the third. There's round. no track record. His numbers were were just pretty good, you know, as a junior relative to other college players. And this is where the Padres do so well though, man, is like you see these guys that kind of fly under the radar and you see the swing and you're like, what's holding these guys back from producing more? Cause that's a very good swing. It's just like one little adjustment away. And that's exactly what Graham Pauly has done. Jackson Merrill was the same story and, and we can go on and on. I think Dylan head is going to be a very similar story as we get to him. It, it's amazing how they are able to ID these guys. Number seven was another player that I was very pleasantly surprised with the more I watched Jack. I mean, he's a good pitcher. Adam Mazur, right-handed pitching prospect, finished the year at double A. He's fun, and he's going to be a good piece for them, assuming they don't trade him. Uh, and I don't think they will because he, he he could slot into their rotation at some point next year. Polished with a good pitch mix. Fastball is really fascinating, and I'm going to dive into that in a second. But second round pick, I got a and there's a little typo there because I'm 14th overall in the second round. I got to fix that. Uh, but it was second round pick in 2022, and 
really has just continued to pound the strike zone with good stuff and climb pretty quickly here. Um, very loose, lanky, uh, good arm speed. And I just, I just love the way this guy pitches. He attacks you and he gets outs. Yeah. I, he's, what do you got him at? Six, three, one eighty. He pitches like he's six, seven, one sixty. Like yeah. He throws like a lank machine. And there's something great about lank machines. If they can time it up. And there are a couple of you know good examples in the big leagues. I think Zach Wheeler is probably the best example of that right now and pretty pertinent. He is lanky as hell. Like those arms extend. It feels like there's not much torso here, and everybody wants to talk extension with the best postseason pitcher in baseball right now. That's what Mazer, you know, has shades of. Obviously, he's not as timed up as Zach Wheeler, because if he was, that's an hundred million dollar pitcher. That's yeah. probably not what Mazer is, but if you can have the lanky but timed up starter kit that Wheeler possesses, chances are you're going to find yourself in a big league rotation because the fastball alone may get stuff done for you. Sheehan is very unique. Emmett Sheehan with the Dodgers. Oh, yeah. Very unique. He can get through four innings with his fastball alone. And, you know, you talk about vertical attack angle and he extends decently well, I'm sure, Sheehan. But He's also just lanky as hell. Like just yeah. looking at that guy stand in the clubhouse, it's like, where's your torso? And that <laughs> that kind of feels like what Mazer is. And the arm speed's big too, because there's something about when guys have that kind of quickness with their arm, the ball just seems to like fly a little bit more. It may not show up in the the track man data as much. I mean, it is above average spin rates on the heater for sure, but there's just something about it where it seems to explode across the you know the final you know, 10, 15 feet, a little bit more. And the other thing I was going to mention, and I'm very fascinated to see if he can, you know, find this. I was looking at pitch to pitch to pitch and a lot of these different outings. The over, if you look cumulatively at the fastball shape, it's very average. But there were a lot of fastballs that he threw, especially down the stretch. And I don't know if it was intentional or not. A lot of times pitchers seem to cut their fastball by accident. Mazer was throwing some fastballs with cut ride where it was getting like 13, 14 inches of, of induced vertical break and zero inches of horizontal. Those were pitches that were all getting big whiffs because the cut ride, I mean, we talk about with Justin Seal, like cut ride is really tough for hitters. It kind of breaks your brain. And the, the pitches that had six, seven inches of horizontal, that's closer to traditional fastball, more dead zone. He was throwing some of these cut ride fastballs that were disgusting. If he can find a way to kind of harness that, then the profile changes a little bit more. I think he could track closer to a three uh, because the slider, it's a gyro slider and it looks like a plus or potentially plus plus pitch that he fills up the zone with, landed it for a strike 73% of the time and hitters just couldn't touch it for most of the season. And then it, the, the curveball and the changeup are good enough as third and fourth offerings. I'd like to see one, you know, flash above average a bit more. Uh, and, and I think that ultimately it's it may be the curveball that does that. Uh, he's still kind of trying to figure out which one separates itself. The changeup did flash at points, but I really think that if he can find that cut ride a little bit more consistently, that's going to be a really fun profile for him. Regardless, I think this is a high probability back end of the rotation arm. And with with how tall or with how over the top he comes, I'm shocked the curveball isn't better already. I think it's going to be the curveball too because the slot that he delivers from and the arm path that he takes is typically like the curveball arm path. And the slider only works if it looks like the fastball out of the hand, and that's clearly yeah. what it is. It's a gyro slider. So you've got the fastball with slight cut occasionally, which makes it look good, and the slider off of that, okay, that's what steel does. If you mix in an over-the-top curveball, then you're cooking with gas. And yeah. you can start cooking with gas soon. Especially if he has that ride on the heater, man. It will be, it'll be fun. So regardless, I think he's got a shot to, to crack – you know, the big league team sometime next year, especially if they need arms. Yeah. Another guy who should potentially get a look next year, whether it's in a bullpen role or, or as a starter, I, I'd hope it's as a starter, but you never know with the Padres and you know how they're just trying to win now. Jairo Iriarte. I mean, this stuff is crazy. And this is the first guy now, as we get to number six, that is featured on the top 100 list as well. Uh, Iriarte low release point. We talked about him in the top 100 as one of the newcomers. So, you don't have to rehash as much. If you want to hear more on him, go go check out the the episode that we did on you know the the top 100 newcomers just a couple episodes ago. But when you get a 
combination of plus fastball and plus slider, both of which I can reasonably see being plus plus and a changeup that's already flashed above average. It's really all about the command here. And he's shown stretches of being able to at least have average command. That's the big question. But low release point, lively fastball, nasty slider, already flashes of a third pitch. Uriarte has a chance to be a really, really good arm. Yeah, we talked about him on the top 100 because he's he's a new arm into the fold on the top 100. He's a new guy in the top 100. And I think you kind of fell in love with the two-pitch mix that he's got. And I totally understand why. He's 21 years old, can run it up to the high 90s. He's got a crazy slider. We talked about it. It's the brash conversation. If he can find the zone, he can be a starting pitcher. If he can't find the zone... He could be a lights out setup guy. And he will. Yeah. Like, and that's the thing is I think he could be in a big league bullpen tomorrow because he's touched 99. And if you put him in one to two inning spurts, I mean, we've seen him because they, they were managing his innings in one to two inning spurts. He was sitting 97. Yeah. And from that release point too, it's a low vertical attack angle. Negative four, two is pretty close to the lower pitchers, you know, in terms of vertical attack angle, flattest angles in, in, in major league baseball, uh, you know, the most elite are kind of like four flat and Emmett Sheehan's like a four flat. That's really impressive stuff. You know, low release, high carry, high velocity slider off of that. As you mentioned, you know, with, with Mazer looks like the fastball until the last second and just an athletic delivery that you wonder why there isn't more command there. I think it can still come. If he has average command, he's, he's a number three type, I think. We, like simply put, and this is going to sound dumb down, but when you have that stuff coming out of your arm, it's kind of hard to, you know, rein it in. Yeah. And like, it's easier if it was 94, but it's 99 and he's, you know, it's max effort, but it's clean mechanics. So hopefully he can, you know, find something and it could be as simple as a snap of a finger and he's, you know, dialing up strikes at the beginning of next year. hundred percent. And that's why I'm very, very excited to see, how he continues to develop in the system and how aggressive they'll be with him. Yeah. Number five is a guy that I think they will be aggressive with going into next year with the field of hit that he has. And another top 100 guy, not as much of a newcomer because we had him in right after the draft in the midseason update. Dylan Head, outfielder in low way at the end of the year. It struggled a little bit just getting acclimated there, but put together some really nice at bats and some nice swings. He's probably going to be a plus hitter. I, I, I look at that swing. I see how advanced it is already uh, flat through the zone, a lot of contact. It might have some elevated ground ball rates compared to other guys with a guy like Dylan had. I'm cool with that, right? Plus hitter uh, who can spray the ball over plus plus runner, great center fielder. Uh, I, I love the mold of a table setting center fielder uh, that can have some of the most elite speed in the game, as well as still enough power. I think there is average power here. Whether it turns into average game power, we'll see. But that still matters because if you're hitting the ball hard, your BABIP is going to be higher. You're going to sneak more hits through the infield. And then again, I, I do think that there's still 15 home run power here, which with this profile, that's a lot of fun. So I love watching his swing because it's so short and compact. Yeah. But like, I don't Based on the plane in which it comes through the zone, it doesn't feel like he's going to hit many homers. No, it's flat. It's it's definitely geared for line drives, but that also usually results in a lot more contact. Yeah. So that's what you want from him, right? Line drive, spray it all over the field. If you run into one down and in, you know, that you can drop the head on, then, you know, no pun intended, you, you, you'll hit some home runs that way too. The way his body and his swing have kind of changed over the – like showcase circuit era of his pre-draft career. Um, I I went back and I watched some video of like the Under Armour Classic and the, you know, other All-American Classics that we've got. I think there's Perfect Game. Uh, there's Under Armour. There's, um, there's a couple others. But like I watched his swings on YouTube from all of those and his setup looks different and his swing itself looks different. And there's some puberty going on there. There's some filling out because he's been in the weight room that's going on there, but also like he's optimized. He was kind of crouched over and he had a ton of bend in his knees before. And now he's a little bit more upright and it's a smooth load back. And it just feels like he looks more coordinated now than when he started the national showcase MLB network junior in high school yeah. 
you're hitting in the same lineup as, you know, all these other high school guys. No, it's, it's a great observation because, you know, what we're always looking for with, with hitters is like slow and controlled early load. Some guys can get away with not doing that, but you know, to make it as easy as possible, I think they, the Padres identified a, again, identified a guy with a great feel for the barrel. And, and that's something that is hard to teach, right? Being able to get the barrel to different spots, having that adjustability, but then tweaking his load, having him be more in his lower half. And by the way, his lower half, he, as you mentioned, like he's gotten stronger there. And he's a guy that likes to be in his legs. That's that's fine. So he's still set in his legs a little bit more, but now sinks into it. And with the slow, controlled load, it seems like everything's on time. And he's now tapping into a little bit more juice too. So it seems like he's just starting to put it all together in terms of the, the complete swing. And that's going to be really fun next year. I think he's going to have a big year next season. I also stand by that he's the fastest guy in the top 100. You ran a 6-2, 60-yard dash. Yeah, I would love to know what Choria would run there. Um, but, but I'm looking forward to like getting get so no. When I'm do you ever run a 60-yard dash? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, can we get them to race? Hope so. Maybe. <laughs> Let's make that like, a, like an all-star festivity. <laughs> I would love that one day. Yeah. Next, number four. Dylan Lesko, uh, another newcomer on the list. So you, you can go check out a little bit more on, on him in that episode as well. But Lesko, top prep arm in the 2022 draft, fell to 15th overall because of Tommy John surgery, but now came back this year. And I mean, well, from what we saw at the end, it was very impressive, right? Plus, plus heater, uh, which it sits mid 90s up to 97, 98 with 20 to 21 inches of induced vertical break, sometimes more than that. Diabolical, like screwball type change up off, off of that, which for those watching on YouTube can see right now in that video. I mean, it just falls off the table and it's in the upper 70s, which is wild. So he's getting like 15, 16, 17 miles per hour of separation there. Then he's got to find the breaking ball. And that's the thing that we were talking about. He can spin it at 3000 RPMs, but he's just, it's too loopy right now. And he struggles to command it. I think a harder slider will work more in his favor. We talked about that. And the command is still a work in progress. Very common coming off of Tommy John and a young power arm. But let's go if it all clicks. <laughs> you got a frontline guy here. Absolutely. Uh, let's go in Snelling can be a one, two punch or like co co aces, co twos, however you want to look at it. Um, this guy's kind of the definition of rocks and fires. Like it's slow. It, the nitpick that I can somehow get to. Like the only thing that I can somehow kind of reach is I wonder how his delivery works at holding runners because he's long. Yeah. But he's like, slow to the plate. Yeah. But so is Framber Valdez. Yeah. <laughs> so is Lester. So like, I'm not going to worry about it. Um, let's go. I love how everything times up and he's got that lean back at his delivery, but it's that, you know, big, like, you know, pump the ball into your glove type thing. It's separating the hands and they come together. Then they separate again. Um, but this guy's fastball is insane. And I went back and I watched some video of one of his all American game starts and he threw the first inning against Justin Crawford and Jackson holiday. There was another guy, but Crawford, he destroyed with <laughs> fastballs. Yeah. He was overpowering him with fastballs. Jackson holiday. He looked so screwed on fastballs and then he gets, you know, just barely a piece of another fastball and he chops one to second base like fastball exclusive in high school. He was dominating two guys that, you know, holiday consensus, number one Crawford borderline top 100. Yeah. I, well, and to that point, I don't think people knew it at the time, but he's just now, he was naturally a high, high IVB, you know, high carry fastball guy that, I mean, I can't imagine as a high school hitter, you're seeing 95 with, 20 plus inches of IVB. And you're like, holy crap. You know, that's crazy. And I watched his last start to the point of the fastball domination. It was a lot of the same against Edwin Arroyo and some other guys where he threw a couple of fastballs that were 23 inches of carry. I mean, 23 inches of vert at 95 miles an hour. Like that's a, that's a 70 plus fastball. Like that's a 70 grade heater. And then some, I mean, that's, that's borderline 80. So we saw flashes of what could be one of the best fastballs in the minor leagues. Uh, if he can harness it a little bit more and consistently, you'll get those 21, 22 inches of IVB. I mean, that's insanity. Yeah. Change up off of that. That's a nightmare for hitters. So Ridiculous. command comes along, please find a slider and, and probably tweak from the curveball. And I mean, and we've heard great things about the makeup. I think it's, 
I think it's going to be a big year for him next year. If he can't find a breaking ball, he's a three. If he finds a breaking ball, it's ace potential. Yeah, it's, it's ace potential for sure. Checking in at number three, Robbie Snelling, left-handed pitching prospect that finished in double A. And Snelling, we talked about him as actually one of the big risers on our top 100 list here because I mean, he was our just baseball pitcher, minor league pitcher of the year, given the workload, given the way he was able to climb three levels. And I mean, this dude, super athletic. We've talked about his, you know, SEC offers that he had as a linebacker. But I mean, the delivery is so smooth. It's a fastball that just jumps out of his hand. Uh, he fills up the zone with it at 93 to 94. Slider off of that looks really good. Change up is flashed as well. And I think that's going to be a, a good third pitch. He has the potential for three above average pitches at least. And plus command, I, I feel really confident about him being a number three, a left handed number three starter. Uh, and I know that I've said a lot, number three, that's kind of, I feel like we get a, a, it's very rare to find a frontline type starter. There's maybe one or two or three guys on a top 100 list that I could truly say with a level of confidence, oh, that guy could be a frontline guy. Snelling has it in him. It's possible, but he's just such a high probability middle of the rotation starter. I love that out of a guy that you just took out of high school. Yeah. He's built like no other pitcher I've ever seen before. And you could say, oh, Strider's lower half. Like, obviously, that guy squats. But there's something about the overall build of Snelling where, like, pitchers don't look like this. I, I look at him in a baseball uniform. I'm like, why are you not playing right field? Why are you not just DHing? Because you look like a masher. And when you get those guys and you put them on the hill, chances are they know exactly what their body is doing at all times because they've spent a ton of time on their body. Like, I don't you know, I don't want to place this on him, but like the, the best example of that is Otani because Otani is like the most athletic pitcher that we've seen. And there's something about being super powerful and a, and a crazy built guy on the mound. It screams durability. Yes. You cannot predict health in pitchers. Yes. But this guy, like there's just something about him that seems overwhelmingly coordinated and he knows exactly what he's doing with his body every single time the ball leaves his hand. Yeah, you know, we don't know how to predict injury and things like that. But the one thing that I do feel confident about is if you you're take powerful, care of yourself, your chances are you're not getting hurt as much. Exactly. And if you're powerful and athletic, that generally seems like a guy that's going to be built for durability. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Snelling was able to shoulder a workload that we don't see teenage, we don't see pitching prospects, period. Yeah. You know, what was it? 126 innings, if I remember correctly. Something like that. I mean, it was it was a lot of innings. And and held the velocity all year long, mind you, as well. I mean, we're talking about his final start of the year. He still averaged 93 and a half on the fastball and grabbed plenty of 96s. Uh, you go through the entire arsenal, by the way. The changeup should be a 45 present, 55 future, by the way. Uh, it's just the command of it right now has been inconsistent. But in terms of just giving up contact, opponents hit 230 against his fastball. They hit 250 against his curveball. And they hit 130 against his changeup. The problem was he just didn't fill up the zone with it enough. I mean, he can keep you off balance with three offerings and fill up the zone and go deep into games. <laughs> it's a really good, durable, solid southpaw. And he's already turning into one of the best in the game in terms of prospects. Yeah, it was 103 innings. So we, okay. we oversold it by about 20 innings. But 100 plus innings from a 19-year-old is uh, relatively uncharted territory. 107 if you count the postseason start. Great. So, yeah, we oversold it by 20. That's on me. It's okay. Uh, Number two, Ethan Salas, catcher in, that finished the year in double A for some reason. Uh, but Salas, we've talked about him because of the fact that he's a wonderkin and we've never seen a 16-year-old uh, break into low A and do as well as he did. And then he gets a promotion to high A, uh, which we thought was aggressive. And then he gets a promotion to double A after a handful of games. And I think that was almost like their own project uh, – what was that? What would be Lake Ellis? No, no. What's, what's double A? Now I'm San Antonio. Point. Yeah. Project San Antonio. <laughs> like I feel like they sent a lot of guys there pretty aggressively. 100%. And I don't know if there was a rhyme or reason behind that. Uh, Salas obviously struggled in high A and double A as a 17 year old, but showed a lot of really good things. Flashed above average power, showed a really good feel to hit a very advanced swing that I'm a big fan of as well. Uh, in terms of just the way he already uses a toe tap, stays into his backside, and gets off powerful swings. It is slow, under control, and then violent, uh, which is really fun. I mean, it, it's a really, really advanced swing. Then behind the dish, 
great receiver. Blocking's a work in progress, but I think obviously it's ahead of any other teenage catcher you're going to see yeah. and getting better and better at, at controlling the running game. But that bat, man, it, it will play. I think it's going to be a plus to plus plus feel to hit above average power and the ability to stick behind home plate. There's a reason why this guy's one of the best prospects in baseball and as unique as, as they've come from a, just a situation standpoint. No 17 year old swing should look like that. No, especially as a catcher from the left side, when you shove him up levels, like there has to be some level of discomfort and you just don't see it at all there. No. And it's, you know, all the best hitters in baseball, it feels like nobody has a quick pre-swing move, especially with that lead leg. I think that's probably the easiest one to see. The best hitters in baseball, it's this slow move, I don't know, back in, into a coil, and then it's a, you know, sharp release as soon as the, the, bat go, the bat head goes flying. And Salas, like, I was just stunned by how slow the load was and how timed up he constantly was. And the thing that jumps out defensively is – you watch him receive that big league spring training <laughs> two inning stretch. And I'm like, he's putting on a show receiving mm -hmm. pitches. No his one hands does. are elite. Yeah. It's amazing. Like he, he just, the way he gets to spots, his strength to be able to just pull balls up very subtly. Uh, he beats the ball to the spot. A lot of times, like yeah, it was a show. And, and, and I thought it was really cool that they did that. And that was just the tip of the iceberg of what we were going to ultimately see. And I think a big reason why they sent him to double is because I think they feel good about the bat. Like, yeah, sure, he's going to struggle there, but I think they wanted him to work with you know, some more advanced pitching and some more advanced coaches you know, at, at the upper levels there and, and continue to develop on the defensive side of things. But when you even see he, he struggled from an offensive output standpoint, but he never looked entirely overmatched in high-end double-A in terms of he didn't expand the zone egregiously. He, he wasn't getting torn apart and striking out at a 45% clip. Like He looked fine. It was just whoa, <laughs> this is a different beast and a lot of weak contact. That should rectify itself as he just gets comfortable. And it was really the, the advanced breaking balls where I'm sure he's just like, I've never seen this before. <laughs> and, and that was some of the challenge. But another patient hitter, sub 20% chase rate, even with those aggressive promotions, great field to hit, and the power is going to keep ticking up. It is it is really fun already to watch him play. And he he's going to be a very special talent. I'm very curious to see how aggressive they're going to be with him. I assume he starts the year in double A and probably spends the whole year there. And that's going to be a, a really awesome learning opportunity for him on both sides of the ball. I think that's how most organizations view it. You should spend the whole year in double A. What do you have yeah. his ETA at 2025? Uh, yes. Six. I have it six, but it should probably be five. It should probably be four. <laughs> the way the Padres operate. That would be nuts. That would be absolutely like not nice. advised, but probably going to happen. Like if I were to actually put, you know, five bucks down with you and be like, hey, when does Ethan Salas debut? Honestly, I'm thinking 2024. I'd take five, but nothing surprises me with this team now Nothing at all. It wouldn't shock me at all, especially if he looks good. And I think he will. I, I, I'm i sure he's already working on the breaking balls, pitch recognition and, and those things to be ready to go in double A talk about makeup off the charts. There's a reason why they're throwing this wonderkin into just different situations that most players his age just don't even sniff. No young 17 year old should like be living out of hotels and apartments like minor leaguers do like, no, nah. they're not built for that. Like this kid is, this kid was supposed to be two years away from being in a college dorm. Yeah. And here he is now like living out of the courtyard in Midland, Michigan. It's pretty amazing. It's crazy. I, top of the list of guys I cannot wait to watch in this coming season. Yeah. Last but not least, number one on the list is Jackson Merrill, shortstop. He finished the year in double, but yeah. I, I was hoping to see him in triple. I was kind of surprised that we didn't see him in triple by the end of the year. But Merrill has been one of my favorite prospects in the game for a while. I still don't think his – really reached anything close to what his ceiling could be in terms of the output. Yeah. But at the same time, put up really good numbers at, at each stop and just continues to get better as the year went on. I see potential for plus plus hit. And the thing is that's really fascinating with Merrill is he's given us flashes of this at least above average power, but it's like, okay, will he be able to tap into it consistently? 
he's a really good hitter. You know, you don't want him to get away from the uh, really, really good field to hit. But then you see these swings, like the yeah. one that we have playing right now for those that are watching on YouTube. I mean, look at him lean with that. Hanging breaking ball from Luna, Carlos Luna, and he absolutely demolishes it to the pull side so far that he's leaning backwards and falls over home plate. That was, a, I think, a 109 bomb, you know, 109 miles an hour to the pull side. He's going to continue to fill out a little bit more. He's also just going to get more comfortable getting his A swing off more consistently. And that's going to be a scary mix because he already has this feel to hit that's hard to teach. He's already flashed the 111, 112 in the exit velocity department. And, oh, by the way, he's a good defender at shortstop who's an above average runner. This is as dynamic as they come if it all comes together. And few guys look the part like Jackson Merrill. He fully looks the part. Like he's got that, you know, everyday shortstop type build. And he's a strong six foot three man. And only strong six three can put that kind of swing on that kind of pitch. He yeah. is like, I don't know, you, you just see him in the field, you see him in the batter's box, and it's like, yeah, you were pretty much born to play baseball, weren't yeah. you? And that's the vibe that he gives off. And the fact that freakish tools follow that, and it's not just 55s across the board he mm -hmm. elevates in the hit department you think he can maybe elevate in the raw power department and he could possibly elevate in the field department like that's ridiculous and that's why you have a 60 plus on the future value i mean that's why he's one of my favorite prospects in the game it's it's a balance of high floor that hit tool already gives him a high floor yeah the, the ability to stick it short gives him a high floor paired with the power that you can dream on here even if it's 15 to 20 homers He's going to hit for average. He's going to steal some bags. He's going to play good defense. If he can cut that chase rate down, that's the one sticking point I have. And he did get a little bit better as the year progressed. Then I'm going to feel really good about the offensive profile. He's you know, a fairly aggressive hitter, but struck out just 12% of the time. As a 19-year-old at the start of the season who you know, aggressively got pushed up you know, to double A and played a large portion of the season in double A, that's extremely impressive. He's... I don't know where he fits in in terms of where they're going to play him uh, because, of course, they have Bogarts and they have Machado and there's some moving parts here. They have given him – they did give him some reps and left at the end of the year, similar to what I was talking about with Grand Pauly, which is nuts, <laughs> but I get it. He even saw a start at first base. I'm imagining they're going to move off of Cronenworth and Merrill kind of is exactly what they were hoping Cronenworth would be and then some uh, – and maybe he plays all over the diamond, even though I think he truly can be an everyday shortstop. Maybe he will be in the future. But in the meantime, he might kind of be that rover that, that they move all over the diamond. That hit tool is going to translate to the big league level, I think, sometime next year, though. I need them to start making decisions. I need yeah. them and the Baltimore Orioles to start making decisions because they both make my brain hurt. And well, the Orioles in a way better way than the Padres. Yeah, they're, they're gonna trim, they're gonna trim salary. So, you know, we'll see. We'll, we'll see if they trade Cronenworth. Maybe they, they get rid of Kim. Kim, also a guy that is only under contract for one more year anyways. So maybe it's, hey, kid, sorry, you're going to have to bounce around a little bit this year. But next year, we got a carved out spot for you at second or you know wherever it may be. Yeah, I'm fascinated to see how they handle this. But in terms of Merrill as a prospect, I think he's big league ready by the middle of next year, maybe even earlier than that. Uh, if he has a really strong camp, could you know force their hand in some ways there. But I'd like to see him get a little bit more time to keep working on tapping into that power. Because if he gets up to the big leagues, you might see him a little bit in fight or flight mode. Remember what we, we saw from Jordan Walker where it was he's putting bat on ball, but it's a lot of ground balls. He's not hitting for as much power. I'd like to see him get another 100 at-bats, 150 at-bats of you know, just trying to tap into game power a bit more because there's 25 home runs in there. And if he finds that, uh, look out. You might have one of the best shortstops in the game. And there are very few places better to elevate and celebrate than in El Paso, Texas. All oh, flies yeah. if you're oh, a Chihuahua. Oh, yeah. That'll do it for this episode. Again, we're going to be doing top top prospect lists through, for all 30 systems throughout the offseason, week after week, moving forward, and some fun programming, as Jack mentioned. We'll keep you posted on all of that. You can go check the write-ups out in the episode description. Playoff coverage, everything you need at JustBaseball.com, as well as plenty of offseason coverage as well. That's it from me. Jack, any final thoughts on this Padre system? I don't think so. Um, I pitched a Halloween-themed episode for later this week, so we'll mm -hmm. see if Aram is willing to buy into that or if yeah. he's just going to be a curmudgeon. I have no yeah, idea. Will, will, will I be fun for once? We will find out. I, I think I would 
Lean towards yes. We'll find out. Uh, but spooky. looking forward to that. Looking forward to the spooky themed episode there. Until then, we will talk to you. Uh, we'll talk prospects with you on Wednesday.